Hello friends, this time great pleasure to have with us Colonel Satish Vaidya. Welcome uh, Satish to this program. Thank you very much Anil. So Satish is uh, replete with uh, stories and uh, so today he is going to narrate to us one of his experiences during the war of, with, uh, you know, that happened in Sri Lanka. And this is a story which happened in Jaffna. Uh, where they, uh, you know, they caught a militant uh, with the help of uh, a radio direction finder. So more about all this story from him. So over to you, Satish. Please go ahead. Thanks, thanks. A pleasure to be with you all as usual. Uh, I was in Sri Lanka for two years and three months from December 87 till the IPKF pulled out in March uh, 90. I see. Uh, this is a story about uh, how we used a radio direction finder to trap a militant and uh, actually capture him. So could you also tell us uh, a little more about the radio direction finder? Yes. Now, this uh, was a small handheld uh, direction finder which looked like a crossbow with an inverted bow. In the bow was pointing forward like an antenna. I see. And it had a pistol grip uh, with which you press the switch and uh, it caught the si uh, radio signals uh, which were coming in and we swept it from side to side and the, there was an analog meter which uh, sh showed the maximum strength at a certain point certain and then again it used to go back. In a certain direction. Yes. April, we were told that uh, some very important leaders of the LTT were in Vadamarachi. This is the area of Vadamarachi where we use the radio finder very effectively. This is the road which goes northwest towards Point Pedro and it goes further southeast towards Champion Pattu. We have the Vadamarachi lagoon towards the east and the Indian Ocean towards the west. This is Nagar Kobil where we started the third day's operation. The village is to the west with mangroves further towards the west and this is where we got the first signal in the morning at 9 o'clock and in the evening uh, while we were searching this village we got the signal at 5 o'clock coming from these huts towards the north. So we were based at Champion Patu and we had to uh, literally comb the area from the southeast towards the northwest in a single extended line with a gap of about 8 to 10 meters between two men and the entire lot of my unit was doing that kind of uh, how many how many how many one uh, men in one go in that one way uh, i think we must have had about 150 200 men oh so you're covering a very huge area a very good, good area and so probably 1.5 kilometers plus that was the kind of area you were covering in one go Yes, one and a half kilometers or so. Yeah, at least. There were other units also, but we were all operating as our own in our own subunits in sort of penny packets. Right, so right. Everybody was like together in one extended right. line. And we used to start early in the morning after breakfast, comb the whole area till lunchtime, right. drink water from our water bottles, eat what we had carried for lunch. And carry on combing again for uh, the rest of the day. Right. Till about uh, almost sunset. So the last, entire day. Right. Uh, there's no concept of working hours in our day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> carry on. In a, in a war zone area. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. Uh, now, while it was, it was hot, uh, it was barren, it was uh, miserable. Like, uh, I mean, it was going through, combing through, or at least visually we went through every inch of uh, land. Because right, right. Each man is covering about 10 meters ahead of him. Yeah. 
No, uh, we were looking for hidden tunnels or hideouts or some kind of caves or something that could be there in the sand dune. And they were rolling sand dunes. So it was kind of open terrain. There, was, there were no buildings which could... So uh, we carried on and these two days finished. And the third day, we were at a place called Nagarkovil. Nagarkovil was one uh, uh, temple quite a distance away from a small settlement. A small village. Now, this direction finder had uh, it was it had an operator who was a, a, a Tamil speaking you know, soldier uh, from the Signal Regiment. Now, uh, this guy opened his uh, set up his direction finder and started scanning at five to nine. We continued scanning, and suddenly we caught a radio wave, and we found that it was coming from where we were in the Nagarkovil Temple we found it was coming from the direction of that uh, little settlement, which was towards our west. Right. Now, uh, we said, okay, now let's go into that village and let's search because there is something there and this, it's a militant. So, yeah. from what he spoke, we knew he was a militant. Right. Now, we went into the village and we searched from house to house. Again, a very monotonous job and sensitive because we are intruding into somebody's house and searching it and kind of uh, so we have to deal with uh, the, the residents of the house and uh, they are generally hostile because they don't like people like soldiers and especially yeah. give intruding into the house and searching it uh, but we carried on as best as we could and without hurting too many of them and uh, we couldn't find anything. But in the evening, when it was time to uh, pack up, uh, it was again sh- time for the next call. So at 5 o'clock, when the operator... Again, yeah, wait and see if something is... Started again. Um, we scanned and we found the same frequency coming from the north of us. And this time, the militant said that uh, he had been... Uh, tired and hungry and he was uncomfortable for the whole day but now he had reached a place and he was comfortable eaten and now resting so we assumed that when we entered the village this guy had escaped into the um, mangroves there was, there was a line of mangroves on the uh, Vadamarachi lagoon which was further to the west Right. so he was probably there and he was sitting in the mangrove um, and he was without food and without uh, any shelter. But now he had evaded us and uh, headed off into the north and where there was a, a few huts. We, we could see them on, marked on the map. A small grove of palmer trees and a few huts. So we said, okay, now this fellow is there and there's nothing else uh, to the north except the the ocean to the west, northwest, and sandy waste. So now that he has reached a place and he has settled down, he's going to be there for the night. Mm-hmm. So we said, let's catch him in the night. Now, uh, at about 6, when it became dark, 6.30 or so, we packed up as usual and moved back to Champion Pattu, which was to the southeast of us, of that location. Uh, we went back to our base, had dinner. I told my CEO, okay, I've got some information and I'm going back to look for uh, what we can get. Mm. Now, we didn't really have too much time to discuss anything. So, he said, okay, go ahead. Mm. So, we had dinner and then we moved back again. It was quite a long drive back to Champion Pattu and again from Champion Pattu back to Nagarkovil. Mm. But we decided to reach uh, not too late so that we don't alarm people at that time. Correct. Uh, so we reached the post at about uh, 9 30 10 uh, rested as best as we could on whatever uh, place we got and at about uh, 12 o'clock 12 30 or so we planned to reach that uh, cluster of huts uh, around two o'clock when it would we would be least expected correct correct so we timed ourselves according to that and we moved from the post and uh, walked through across this uh, open sandy waste 
and reached that place at about uh, two o'clock. Now the moonlight was reflected from the the sand dunes, the sand, and it was pretty bright. It, one it, one could see almost as far as the horizon. Generally, it was bright. Right. But, uh, but what uh, we know of night vision is that our eyes have the rods and the cones. Correct. The cones uh, are useful in the sunlight. And are and give us color perception, whereas the rods uh, give us a black and white vision, and they work in starlight and moonlight. So we could see everything, but it was all black and white. We didn't right. require any night vision device or anything. Right. And we went and uh, surrounded those huts. Now the number of men I had must have been barely about forty to fifty. But I think uh, when we are all working in coordination with each other, that kind of number is quite uh, yeah, enough. Yeah, yeah. So we surrounded all the huts and rounded up everyone from all of them, and I made them sit on an open uh, patch uh, in a way that they could not talk to each other, like in an exam. Mm -hmm. And we were watching them from all sides. Correct. Um, now I had to identify this one outsider from among the residents of those huts. Correct. Tricky job. No one's going to tell me that this fellow is uh, the one. And they actually, hide him. And yeah. I, they would do everything they could to see that I couldn't identify him. Yeah, conceal his identity and protect him. Yeah. Yes. So they would, if I had, uh, if they'd known what questions I was asking. They would have coordinated with each other, and they would have uh, all given me a nice uh, coordinated answer. Coordinated lie. Yes, <laughs> and they would have taken me for a ride. So I didn't allow them to talk to each other, and I made them sit far apart, and uh, I started interrogating them one by one. Now I said, "Who is this person who's an outsider?" Who? I mean, I asked them all sorts of uh, questions, which would uh, get me something, some. Shred of an information which I could uh, grab onto. Correct. Now, while I was doing this, I found one particular guy who was looking down most of the time, and he would look up occasionally towards me. And when I focused my attention on him, he was looking down. He looked up, and then as he, the moment he saw that I was looking at him, he quickly looked down. He was said, nervous he was already. Like, Oh, he is the evasive guy. So I centered all my questions to everybody about him. I said, who is this guy? What is his name? And they tried to tell me his name, but uh, like that question about the four students who bumped off and came back and uh, gave an excuse that their tire got punctured. So the 98% of the marks were meant for the question, which tire was punctured? <laughs> I, I remember this so something like that. So I asked him. Uh, so nobody would give me his, his name. Uh, they couldn't tell me who we were staying with. The person who tried, who was staying with him. Uh, so these mismatch between all their answers Correct. sort of convinced me that this guy was the one. Now, having been out in the open for. Two full days prior to that, and then on the third day also we'd had a active uh, full day, and then we're continuing throughout the till the night. Now, by the time I finished all this interrogation, it was almost uh, three three thirty in the morning. Mm -hmm. I said I've got the man, and the man is more important than anything else. Correct. So we got him. We tied his hands behind his back with a nylon rope. So uh, we headed back, and I said I'm going to take this fellow. To my CEO as a gift, I said, "Look, I've got this fellow, and this radio direction finder worked beautifully."